Listen to this podcast or I'll gut you. Welcome back, horror hounds, to Ghostman and Rivera's Horror Show Podcast. I'm Mike Ghostman Pickle. And I'm James Rivera. Today we are going to be starting our first Giallo special, Modern Giallo special. So Mike and I have a new thing. What we're going to be doing is every so often, uh, we are going to be doing a podcast about two or three or maybe even four modern Giallo films. And the reason we're doing this is because Giallo is a very niche subgenre of, uh, of, of horror film. For those of you who don't know, it's a classic Italian subgenre of films. It's kind of like a precursor to the slasher, although they were based a little bit more on a little bit more on the mystery novels and they played up the mystery aspects. There's always a killer, usually has a black glove. You don't know who it is. There's always some form of twisted sexuality involved. And the kill sequences are always beautiful or colorful, or they manage to make candy out of blood. It had its heyday in the 70s, with people like Argento, Fulci, Sergio Martino. I mean, we did a Giallo special about classic Giallo, if you want to go back and check it out. It's a subgenre that sort of died off, or at least we thought it died off. There is a whole world of that there of modern Giallo films that seem to fly under the radar. And I think the reason is because they are probably very niche so we're going to start exploring these from time to time and this is our first modern giallo special we're doing all the modern giallos seem to come along with the resurgence of the old ones this year shutter added all those new giallos on there oh, i'm loving that it's very interesting to see how modern filmmakers interpret that type of film because it's it's pretty unique and pretty uh you know niche type of movie so the three movies we're going to be discussing today are the editor i see you and piercing we're kind of discuss what we think didn't work about a giallo tribute and then we'll discuss things that did work the first one is the editor from 2014. Uh, this one's written and directed by adam brooks and matthew kennedy they're both actors in the movie and uh and you can kind of tell it's a giallo parody as interpreted by actors because most of the filmmakers are mostly actors and they've just gotten into uh, filmmaking uh, it stars Paz de la Huerta, who was awesome in Enter the Void, um, Choke, Empire. Yeah, and Choke, The Tripper, and even Nurse 3D. She had her own movie, Nurse 3D. It was flawed, but it was pretty damn good. It's kind of like a Miss 45 type of movie. And then uh, Adam Brooks, of course, writer, the writer-director of the movie, he plays the editor. And uh, the great Udo Kerr is in this one from Cigarette Burns and Theater Bazaar and Suspiria. And uh, also Lawrence R. Harvey, that uh, that big fat killer guy from Human Centipede Two, is surprisingly good in this. He's actually he's actually a better actor than the others in this movie. I thought. Yeah. <laughs> a big a big step up from his acting in Human Centipede Two. But uh, the synopsis is that it's a it's an absurdist giallo thriller about a film editor who was once the best of all time until an accident left him with four wooden fingers and he is reduced to editing pulp and trash films. When the lead actors from these films are brutally murdered, the editor is thought to be the killer. And it comes off just as silly as the synopsis is. <laughs> okay, so um, the editor, uh, let's start off with what, what, what I like about it or what we like about it. What I liked about it for the most part is um the aesthetic choices that they make and some of the um a lot of the uh, anachronistic elements that the movie has for example the movie looks old the way that it's filmed i'm not sure how it was filmed but it has the appearance of old film stock if you're aware of all those old giallo films they were usually dubbed in english if you watch them in america they're really bad dubbings and they were all sometimes they were off and little cheesy some movies more than others but somehow these movies were not necessarily always about the characters or the acting. They were about atmosphere and mystery. So you kind of ignored that. Uh, this gets the over the top gore and the type of violence that existed in Giallo movies down. 
the type of sleazy characters that you would see in, in Giallo movies, the kind of sick uh, sexual obsessions that you see in Giallo movies. When the movie started, I was actually really digging what I saw. I thought for the first five minutes, I was like, cool, this feels like an old Giallo film from the 1970s, and I felt kind of immersed into the world. However, the further it goes along, the more the movie started to grate on my nerves. For one, I thought this was going to be, and this might be my fault for, uh, for my misperception, I thought this was going to be a genuine tribute to uh, Giallo films, and it's not. It plays like straight parody or a satire of what Giallo movies are. And that's fine, but for me, this goes in way too obnoxious of a direction, and I get a lot of what they were going for. But in making this too over the top, too jokey, too obnoxious, the part performances are too in your face, it kind of loses what was special about those Giallo films that it's parroting and it's going so far out of its way to ape the look, the style, and the feel of those movies. And it just, to me, makes all of those movies seem like kind of a joke. And I understand what it's going for. I can accept a movie that parodies a genre, movies like a scary movie, or even Scream which is um, a less subtle comedy, which is also a horror movie that spoofs it. I think this could have been done in a way that was funny and loving and more respectful. I didn't get that off of the movie. And look, I understand it is a loving tribute to Giallo films, but it goes in such an obnoxious direction that it actually started to turn me off. And it takes what works about those movies, pumps it up to a thousand, and makes it not work, makes it go in the exact opposite direction. Well, that's why I was saying that the editor is a giallo movie, like scary movie is a horror movie. Okay. I mean, a scary movie is a little more elementary, yeah, but it's not as annoying as this. No, it with, isn't. With, with scary movie, scary movie seemed like it was a parody made by people who love scary movies. This seemed like it, may, it was made by people who thinks that think that giallo movies are stupid. And that's what's confusing. I don't actually think the filmmakers think that, but it comes across yeah. that way because you wouldn't go out of your way to make to design the aesthetic of this movie so specifically to get the dubbing styles down, like the bad dubbing to get the types of violence. It's very clear that it's a movie made by people who've watched the genre very closely, who studied it, but it doesn't come across as to me, it doesn't come across as loving. And that's where a lot of my issues come, come with it. I think the humor is so stupid that I, some of it made my head spin. I didn't under, understand what they were going for. I thought the performances at first seemed kind of funny, but after a while they were absolutely obnoxious performances that started to like grate on my nerves. And then this movie's not very long to begin with. And I felt myself kept checking the time at the halfway point. I was like, okay, let's, let's start wrapping this up. Let's get to the point. And it keeps going after that. And like I said, it's not long, but it feels really long to me. The twists it pile on are dumb. I don't know if it's trying to parody the fact that Giallo movies often had outrageous twists with weird things happening. If that's what it's going for, I don't, I don't think I got, that off of, I got that off of it. It just seemed obnoxious. All the performances are pitched at such a bad rate. And, uh, and don't get me wrong, a lot of this is intentional. A lot of what I don't like about this movie is not the result of inept filmmaking or a lack of vision or directors who don't know what they're doing. They know exactly what they're doing. I just don't care for what they are going for. And it just, it really doesn't work for me. I can see how this might work for some people, but it just goes in directions that it feels like after a while, I feel like it's just kind of thumbing its nose at the audience, no longer engaging me as a story. It's, it, it seemed to not take itself seriously, but at the same time, too seriously by making it look so much like a giallo film yeah it was, it was very jokey and and i definitely had a better time because i watched it for the first time with friends online in, in a, with a group of friends i had more fun with it but it was even annoying then okay but but you can kind of deal with annoying when you're with friends and you're having fun because i mean it did look good it had uh decent scarce sequences that that don't feel like giallo even though they have tons of elements of giallo they didn't feel like giallo at all it's great kills and gore beautiful women sex and nudity strange sadistic killer everything is there that's supposed to be in a giallo but none of it feels giallo and uh yeah and uh let's talk about pause de la fuerte oh yeah to me i mean i really have to 
kind of hamper my dampen my uh opinion on this because i despised her in this i think this is the worst and most annoying she's ever been in her career it's it's not only fingers on a chalkboard annoying she's a horrible character her acting is awful and she she acts like she's never done this before and she's done some damn good movies i and here's the thing the, and therein lies my problem with 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 the movie because i've seen pause de la huerta i'm familiar with her from enter the void and on um, she was on boardwalk empire where she played one of uh, steve buscemi's mistresses and i've always liked her she's good at playing like the certain type of thing she's always struck me as somebody who knows what she's doing in front of the camera i don't think she's the problem i think the reason her performance is bad and obnoxious and her character is irritating is because that's the direction that the filmmakers pushed her in this is the perf i get the feeling this is the exact performance that they wanted out of her it's just so mocking and so lazy and condescending at the same time there's something about her character that just grates on my nerves there's lazy jaded delivery and that i know so much but like it has such an amateur feel to it but like the feel of an amateur that's being very aggressive with their craft if that makes sense to you very aggressive and then her character is really poorly written which may or may not be part of the, the point the twist that it comes at with, with regards to her character are not earned by the story at all it feels dumb when it sees where she's going in and I get the feeling that you're supposed to get the feeling that the main character, the editor, is in love with his wife, Paz de la Huerta. But there's nothing about the relationship where he feels like he needs to save her that feels genuine. She just... Nah. The character and the attitude of her character and the acting seems contemptuous of the whole thing. Her, She seems like she's on set being contemptuous of the film that she's making. And again, I don't think that's because of Paz de la Huerta. I just think that's what they wanted out of her. But there's like... Do you understand what I mean by that? It almost seems like it's a character that's just contemptful of this whole thing and not like taking it seriously. It just, her character in particular and that performance drags this movie down a lot more. And it was already suffering before we even get to the problem of Paz de la Huerta's horrendously awful, obnoxious performance. Yeah, and it, and it does come off as deliberate and that does not help it. No, <laughs> that she's deliberately being like that. <laughs> Um, yeah, this, uh, th this reminds me a little bit of, um, strange comparison, the movie Mank, the David Fincher movie that came out late last year, that was, um, about Orson Welles and, uh, Herman Mankiewicz in the movie Citizen Kane. That movie was aping old Hollywood style films, like the look of like old Hollywood, the black and light white, the anachronistic acting styles and everything. But it felt like this does, an empty version of what it's doing. Instead instead of just making a good film that kind of calls back to that era, these films are so busy trying to imitate what it was that they miss what was so special about them and they become very hollow at their core. And that's a strange comparison, but as different as those these two movies are, I think they're great examples of paying too much attention to an aesthetic and style and not actually living in it, not actually breathing in it, making it feel like pastiche instead of tribute. Both this and Mank, I had the same problems with as vastly different as they are. I don't like this type of approach to filmmaking. It's not really for me. If you're going to go for it, you need to try to capture the soul of what made those original movies special. Don't mock it to this extent, especially if you're going to go out of your way to pour a lot of, and look i i cannot deny the craftsmanship that went into this movie it they really worked very hard to get the look the aesthetic the feel the dubbing the gore everything down it seems like they studied everything but the one missing ingredient is the sincerity the heart the genuine feeling that the artist behind the camera believes in the vision that they are presenting to you and i don't get that impression at all with this movie well, this is one of those movies where they throw a lot of shit at you. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it, it's so a lot of it does end up working, but there's so much shit they throw at you. The majority of it does not work. The, I, the majority of it just falls flat, but it does have like some great sequences, like the, the, a couple funny sex scenes, uh, some pretty cool stalking sequences that actually, those are the only ones that actually felt like Giallo. 
Uh, and then the, when the woman gets her face pulled off, a great effect that she gets the skin pulled off of her face. And shows but then on. just really stupid that she puts it back on and kind of fixes it. I'm like, up to that point, it was kind of parody and kind of tongue in cheek, but not that tongue in cheek. That's when it was like, come on, you're going like airplane scary movie level parody on this one. And and then like the uh, the the guy's guts cut out and fed into the projector. That was really cool. Uh, all the great over all the all over the top gore sequences are really good. Uh, decent climax. It was pretty silly, but more entertaining than the rest of the movie. I thought because that that's when it finally went. It it embraced the batshit nature of it, and it kind of went see, nuts at the end. I I could see how you would feel that way, but it only got on my nerves more at the end. <laughs> and the reason is like I don't feel like if the whole movie had been like a fun parody like a little bit more loving i might have bought it but by that point when it starts getting really ridiculous and really batshit to me it just felt like it went from stupid to ultra stupid it just started yeah. going like a hundred miles per hour and smacking me in the face with its it's overbearing the movie's overbearing and i can't even remember all the jokes and i don't want to because i push them out of my head some of these jokes like that they go for just made my head spin they made me like smack my head i just some of it just felt i don't know some of this just felt not that, that's that's the, that's the thing i'm all for parody i'm all for silly you know balls to the wall crazy over the top but when the jokes aren't landing when they're not funny and especially all the smacking of women yeah the the misogyny was present in a lot of uh giallo yep. films but here it just seems like it was shoehorned in there it was never funny i mean a joke that barely worked once and then it didn't stop him from doing it again and again throughout the movie and it just made me cringe every time it's just one of the many things that was just stupid about the whole experience <laughs> despite yeah. all the good things about it i mean look we can do, like there are elements obviously of giallo movies that are obviously misogynistic i think we can all acknowledge that even if we're, we're fans of those movies however i have this thing where like Movies are products of their times, and I recognize it. It doesn't make the attitudes right. However, I can look at a movie at a, as a product of its time, see the attitudes, and, you know, put it in context like that. I think that if you were going to bring that element back to the modern era, you need to be, you need to have a better take on it than what this was. Like, if you want to, like, do that, like, this movie is too silly and does not take itself seriously enough to be adding that element in to make it over the top and not to like really comment it or like it doesn't have any reason for that that element to be there. It doesn't comment upon it. It might have been interesting if this were more um, clever tribute to Giallo that kind of like played with that element that discussed it and like not discussed it, but you know, if the film explored that element in a more interesting way but here it just feels like exploitation in the worst possible way. But like that was something that existed in those movies. Yes. But there was never this over the top and calling this much attention to it. I don't know what purpose you are trying to accomplish in a movie that doesn't take itself this seriously. That just really falls flat for me. Yeah. And, and I usually don't like to tell filmmakers what they should have done. But on this one, wouldn't it have been much more effective if, if some of the men would have tried the misogynistic shit and then the women were having none of it? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that have been funnier? Wouldn't that have sold the joke a little more? It might have sold the joke a little bit more, but this movie, it's just, it's like one of those big clown hammers that keeps beating you over <laughs> the head over and you know what I'm talking about. Right? Yeah, no, no, nothing else is clever. Why would I expect that to be clever? Yeah, I expect <laughs> that to be clever. Like, to me, it's not clever. But it's definitely very, very, very well crafted and it's very exacting in its vision and it's very much what the filmmakers wanted. And that's either going to work for you or it's really not. And I've noticed because I've been going through and on, on reading different reviews going on Rotten Tomatoes, Letterboxd, IMDb, like I could see that this movie really, really works for you or it really doesn't. There isn't very much of an in-between. I don't think you could go watch this movie and say, oh, that was okay or have an indifferent feeling about it. For all of it's what's bad, I do admire, I, I can admire, even in films that I don't like that go for what they're going for and when it's an uncompromised vision like this is. 
it just doesn't work for me at all. Yeah, a, a lot went into it. It just didn't connect with me. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of it did, but it's just, like I said, way more, way more of it felt too flat for me to even take it seriously. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's of... one that, that I enjoyed, like I said, with a group of friends, but e even then it was annoying. And then watching it again, it was just uber annoying, like ridiculous. It, you, you there, I have no patience to sit and watch it by myself. <laughs> See, I watched it by myself and I knew that you watched with a group of friends. To me, I'm like, I might've gotten a little bit more enjoyment out of this movie with the group of friends, some beers and a couple joints that might have made this a little bit more taller but as it is just to me like zone out on a movie just to pay attention to it really struck me the wrong way yeah well it, there's something about viewing with a group of friends like you uh i don't know you, you're you're entertained by stuff you're not normally entertained by like you're entertained by the reactions <laughs> of others too yeah exactly when i'm watching with a group and nudity is on screen people are like ooh boobies and then you don't do that while you're by yourself. It's like, oh, yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. So you're not like titillated. <laughs> yeah. So that's the only way that I could see watching this movie. And even then I wouldn't want to watch it again, but I kind of yeah. wish that I had at least seen it in a group of people with uh, mind altering substances to make it a little bit more tolerable. And I'm, I'm glad I saw it once. And it's, it's actually, uh, a good lesson on how not to do a modern giallo. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. Unless, of course, you're going for that, but um, yeah, I don't see why but you. So. I I don't know. It's it's not a genre that's ripe for parody to me. I think you could do a parody, but it has to be more of like a scream parody, not a scary movie parody. And I think you know what I mean. The difference you have to, if you're going to parody it, it also still has to function as a straight giallo movie at the same time. Yeah. The Scream does very much parody slasher movies, but it still functions as a straightforward thriller or slasher movie, despite the fact that it's commenting on, on it. I could see something like that working, not something this mocking of it. Yeah. Definitely. It, it wasn't it wasn't paying homage, it was mocking it. Definitely. Yeah. So, on to so the... For our next movie, we fast forwarded a few years and fast forward in quality too. Yes, we do. This one is 2019. It's called I See You. It's directed by Adam Randall. Um, he's actually a, a fairly new director. He just directed I Boy with Maisie Williams, which I was not interested in seeing until I saw this movie. Mm -hmm. So it's on uh, uh, Netflix, I Boy. So uh, he directed that and it was written by Devin Gray. Uh, this is a, he's a first time writer um, and he's an actor from uh, he was had a big part in Dexter uh, this really good movie 13 sins he was in I don't feel at home in this world anymore and uh, so that's the writer and then the stars are Helen Hunt I love seeing Helen Hunt in a horror movie I, I look through her credits I, I believe this is her first and only horror movie unique choice for her horror movie too yeah which is awesome because it's, it's a pretty graphic horror movie and then uh, uh, John Tenney plays her husband, and then her son is played by Judah Lewis. Uh, he's an awesome up-and-coming actor. He was uh, the, the main star in The Babysitter and Summer of 84. So the synopsis is when a small-town small town detective investigates the disappearance of, of a young boy, strange occurrences, occurrences endanger him and his family and lead him to the belief that the person he's looking for is someone close to him. Now this one, it gets it right right away like mm -hmm. it's very evident you're about to watch well, well when i when i first put it on i didn't even know i was watching an homage uh, to giallo it wasn't until i got got through that first scene that i realized oh shit, this is a a new giallo movie because it sets the mood immediately with these those strange sounds and then the camera fl floats through this small town and then it almost seems like a force of evil and then like is this a diversion Mm -hmm. to what the movie actually is it almost seems like a supernatural diversion before it brings you back no this is a this is a real grounded uh story and then we start seeing the family drama play out uh we see that helen hunt did something really bad uh to cause drama between her and her husband but we don't know what it is yet 
And then I love how we kind of get hints that she did something bad, but we don't know what it is. And as the story plays out, you realize, ooh, ooh it's, whoa, it's really bad what she did. You know, mm-hmm. she betrayed him. Uh, the score and the camera work pulls you in right away. The mystery, the atmosphere keeps you engaged, just like all the greatest giallos. Uh, and I love how we started to see the investigation. It almost turned into an investigative movie, but then the focus on horror just dominates. The, the, the horror and the dread, it dominates the investigation, even though the investigation uh, is pretty interesting. Uh, the son is, is so mean to the mom for what she did, and it helps you believe the diversions that's thrown at you. You know what I mean? I, because that kid the, pissed me off. Huh? That kid pissed me off. Oh, I know. He was so... I know she, I know she fucked up, but I, I look, I, this is a bias. I grew up, I, I had a crush on Helen Hunt when I was a kid. And seeing, I was like, you don't talk to her like that, you little bastard. Yeah. Other than that. <laughs> and, and plus, we don't know how bad it is what, what she did when, when, when he's already treating her like shit and like, it how, is bad. How bad could it have been? That Don't get me wrong. It is. It's pretty bad. It's let, yeah. let's, let's be honest. It's pretty bad. You probably would be upset at your mother too if you were in that situation. It's just I have a soft spot for Helen Hunt in my heart, and I don't like seeing people speak to her that way. But it's just a movie. It's just a character. Moving on. Yeah. <laughs> but what I love about the score it, is it grabs you right away, and then it keeps adding layers that pulls you in even more. So the so even when you're when you're experiencing the family drama. The score even makes the family drama gives it a dark edge. Mm-hmm. So uh, the dark le- it gives it a dark layers of drama and horror kind of blend into each other, mm-hmm. and, and it's really started getting like the more it, it grabs you right away, and then with each scene, you, I got more and more excited for it. Uh, that that whole scene where something is under the son's bed, and there's a, a strange horn sound and dis- the distorted score. That's when it kind of uh, hinted at that maybe it was supernatural, and I think that was another diversion. I, th- I think that was this this director like playing with your perceptions, like like pulling you back from what you think it is, and then dropping you in it again, pulling you back and dropping you in it, and then all those uh, calls that Helen Hunt gets. That, and that's another thing. Telephone calls have a lot to do with a lot of the great giallos, and that's where it really felt like an authentic giallo to me when Helen Hunt was getting all those calls from her boyfriend's phone. And there's a record playing and just I got kind of chills right now just talking about it. And then uh, it goes along. I get more excited as each each uh, scene goes along. And some it starts getting wobbly somewhere around the, the beginning of the third act. And the, sw- the twists start going nuts. And they almost seem out of place to the rest of the film because the rest of the film is so patient, so layered. <clears throat> and then it, it starts out really engaging and then it just puts on layer upon layer of interesting stuff but then when it starts to it makes it that much more obvious when it starts to fall apart it's borderline convoluted plus the score gets louder and louder as we we're shown that that's that's one thing that bothered me about the the climax you get these twist upon twist upon twist and they start feeling a little convoluted and then you got the score getting real loud as we're shown the twist again that we just saw it's kind of just you know when you're wink safe. wink just in case you didn't catch that look here you and know then so. the last movie throws one last twist in that for me was one too many after a while um yeah i actually really did enjoy this movie though um what i like about it especially in comparison to um the hell did we just talk about the editor okay editor. <laughs> yeah comparison to the editor this doesn't go as far as the editor to try to like get that aesthetic, that, that like downright aesthetic of what a Giallo movie is, you know, go, go to work towards the dubbing. This movie feels like a modern movie that came out the year that it was made. But it feels like, uh, the best way I could describe it, it's like if the Giallo genre had never stopped driving since the 1970s or the 1980s, and this was just its natural progression in 2018. I mean, 20, oh, uh, yeah, 2018. That's the impression that I got of that they were trying to do a Giallo film as if Giallos had never stopped being a thing, as if they've always existed. And I think that effect that works so much better. It's not calling attention to itself while also still feeling like it. It's not being overly anachronistic. It feels like of its time. 
and it does get a lot of what those giallos get right. And here's what it gets right that I don't think the editor gets. The best thing about giallos, the best ones anyway, they are rich in atmosphere. And I mean they yeah. are rich in atmosphere. The score, the cinematography, the way that it just lulls you in. And again, a lot of giallos are not really, some of them are not the best written mysteries out there, but the effectiveness comes through the filmmaking. And I think this movie really communicates it. It's filled with dread. It's very enveloping from the time that it starts. You feel a sense of tension escalating throughout the entire movie. You're very deeply engrossed in it. Uh, I love seeing Helen Hunt. I haven't yeah. seen her in years. I haven't seen her much of anything in years. It's a, I used to have a crush on her as a kid, so it was cool to see her again as an older mom character. Um, I I was very, very enveloped in the movie. My my big thing is that the third act really starts to fall apart. It's one too many twists that I don't know if all of them are earned, and it starts to drive its twist home in a way where you're like, okay, I get it, I get it. And then the one last twist is one step too far to me it just started to seem all too convenient the way that this all came together and the way like it 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 got very very wobbly however the third act has some serious issues it's not enough to do a lot of damage where this is not a good movie this is still a very enjoyable film just on the level of that it gets you it creeps you out it's very engrossing. You get the atmosphere, you get the chills. And even when it starts going a little off the rails, you're never bored by it. It never loses your attention or you're never like, ah, oh, fuck this movie. Or you're not, you don't feel the need to turn it off or anything like that. I just don't think that the third act works as well as it should have. Yeah. And I mean, in, in a lesser movie, the third act would have been much better. I mean, it, the, the third act and the climax and everything was still fun. I, yeah, I mean, I do, I do like, you know, campy twist upon twist and stuff like that, but it's just the contrast to the rest of the movie. Yeah, that's, like, you're right, you're right. It's not that I do, you tap into something. I don't dislike the end. I was still entertained. It just didn't feel up to snuff compared to what I was watching before. That's, yeah. That's a good way to put it. Like, it seemed like the, the third act was the ending of a lesser movie. Yeah. It, where the, the, the rest of it was just so superbly crafted and, and so compelling and it and it draws you in, it keeps you there and just and you start out interested and you only become more interested with each scene. Mm-hmm. Escalate so it, it, it just calls that third act to attention, you know, that just wasn't as effective. Yeah. So it seems like weird. Last week we seemed to disagree quite a bit when we were discussing our films for the best of 2020 and we seem to be kind of in sync at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, I would still definitely recommend this movie, especially if you're looking for a modern giallo. I think this is something that you can't go wrong with. I think that you're probably going to be invested in it right away. And all the performances are very strong too. I, I liked one of the twists that involved frogging and those two characters that were interesting. And I'm not going to ruin what, what that means and what, what happens in the movie. There's yeah. two characters that are thrown in the middle of the movie that you didn't know, no conception of before. And they're interesting and they add a, an interesting dynamic, but the twist that their characters take towards the end in the third act seems there makes their presence there in the first in the movie seem a little wonkier. Yeah. Right. First, when they show up, you're going with it and everything. But by the time the third act goes, you're like, wait, what? Like, like, and look, I'm not going to spoil it, but there are some things that if I were to spoil it, I'd have to question the logic. Okay, so these characters are doing something very fishy, but this character also has a connection to this and that. And how did they get like, it just, it, it caused too many questions that I don't mind that I don't think the script is prepared to answer. Yeah. But I, w- I would say that, you know, I still highly recommend watching it. Don't let, you know, our talk of the third act hinder you from watching this because it's still a good, enjoyable movie. And even the third act is enjoyable just compared to the rest of it. It's kind of a letdown, but yeah, but uh, yeah, it's a totally Mm -hmm. movie worth watching. I really enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, And like I said, it's, it's only a letdown because they, they, they probably go for a little too much at the end. Maybe. Mm -hmm. You know what also makes this work better in comparison to the editor is um, 
a lot of some of the the giallo films like uh how the editor does it where they're badly dubbed and it's more about the atmosphere and the mystery um some giallo films do really good drama in there this one actually has compelling drama going on with the family like yeah. separate of the giallo elements those elements are effective completely separated from any giallo or horror or violence or anything like that just on the level of it being a drama of a family uh, of a family going through some kind of crisis after the mother does something really bad that kind of throws the dynamic out of whack i think a lot of that stuff is actually compelling and i i like that because a lot of giallos don't focus on that i feel like the the drama of this movie and the tension that you feel and the mystery of what did Helen Hunt do that was so wrong and why are they treating her like this and what's going like all of that um, adds to the compelling nature of the storyline. And I think that's another thing that makes us effective as opposed to something like the editor, you're invested in the character dynamics, you're invested in what's going on with them and you kind of, you want this fam and it's funny you don't even see how this family was in happier times it starts off bad but you want to get them back to the happy times because you start to care very deeply about these people and the the smirkiness and the attitude of something like the editor it's hard to give a shit about what's going on with anybody and i think that's also a good marker in, in differences sincerity yeah, and you're you're invested in all the family drama from from the point of view of each of the family. You're you're invested in the the father and the son's drama for being so resentful toward the mom, and you're you're uh, you're invested in her drama with her regrets and mm -hmm. and trying to fix things and trying to get her family back like it was. So so every everybody's drama is is compelling and draws you in. It's it's not just her perspective or 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 the the dad's perspective, you know. Yeah, it was, it was a it was a well well rounded uh, dramatic telling of the story. Do you think we're gonna see a lot more of Judah Lewis because he's in the Babysitter movies, he's in those Christmas Chronicle movies on Netflix, he's in Summer of '84. We talked about. Apparently, he was in the Point Break remake, which I have not seen. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> and based on reviews, I probably shouldn't see it, but um. That kid looks like he's going to be heavily involved in the horror genre or something. He's, he's got that charisma, and, and he's very good with the, uh, the coming-of-age type of story. Mm -hmm. Very good with it. Let's see how long he keeps those baby face looks, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so th those, those two movies alone are a good marker in the contrast of of, of quality of how you could approach a giallo and make it sincere or how you could approach it mockingly. Yeah. So, uh, we discussed the modern giallo that we thought just didn't work as a modern giallo. Then we discussed a very good modern giallo that we felt kind of got rickety at the end. And now we're going to discuss one that we thought was really solid beginning to end piercing in 2018. This one's written and directed by Nicholas Pesky. From Eyes of My Mother, another awesome movie. And it's based on the novel by Ryu Mikurami. Mik Murakami. Murakami. Really who, quick. Who, go on. Who did audition. Yeah. So it's a very audition type of story. You know, it's funny. I, I was watching, as I was watching this, I was like, this reminds me a lot of audition. Obviously, it's different enough that they're way different movies. And when I found that fa fact after, I was like, of course that came from the same imagination. Of course it did. Yeah. That makes total sense that this would come from the same mind, but it totally reminded me that. When the credits came on this movie, I saw Nicholas Pesky. Pesky, I knew the name. I knew Eyes of My Mother, but I couldn't recall what the movie was. I was like, I'm not going to look. I'll wait till the movie's over to look at the director. And I was like, I saw who it was. I was like, oh, no wonder it was so fucking good. But this is like... um. This is exactly what you want a modern giallo film to be. It's yeah. more giallo than the last movie, uh, ICU. Like it, 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 it hammers home the giallo elements a little bit more than that movie does. Um, it has some of what the editor does, where it's trying to apply the aesthetic, the split screens and stuff like that, but not in a way that's old. You know what I mean? Not in a way that yeah. tries to make it look like it came out in the 70s or the 80s or something like that. This one, uh, kind of like how ICU makes it seem like it just the giallo developed into a modern style. 
this is if a giallo developed closer to its roots of what the 70s and 80s movies are, where it's still kind of evolved to fit with the times, but it's still aesthetically and in feeling and tone a lot closer to me than ICU is to a giallo movie. Like it feels like each of these movies builds closer and closer, gets more and more to the core of what a giallo movie was and what makes them work. And what, what I love is it never seems like it's trying to be a giallo movie. Mm -hmm. There's, there's, there's one where it, it, even when it makes it painfully obvious that this is a giallo movie, but by even pulling a song from a, uh, famous Deep giallo movie. Deep yeah, red. red, the Goblin score. I mean that that doesn't even feel like it's it's trying to be a giallo. It just feels like it is. You know what I mean? It it doesn't feel like someone attempting to be, but but that just made it painfully obvious. It just brought it to the surface. Like this is a giallo movie. And also the the novel that it's based on, Piercing, is just a book that's just supposed to be horrifying. It's not written. The book is not like a giallo book. It's uh, the the filmmaker took a book that was very disturbing in terms of its content and what it's about and fashioned it in the tradition of a giallo movie. He all obviously saw the elements in the story already that translate perfectly to a giallo film. And what this one really gets down about the giallo movies there's always weird Oedipal complexes with some of the killers in these Giallo movies. They have weird obsessions with their mothers or they have some form of depraved, twisted sexuality linked to some kind of weird ass trauma in their lives. Or like there's always like these weird kinks or this weird, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like sexuality connected to violence and trauma and something very damaging that makes a person not able to function normally in real life. This one gets that element down really well with the main character whose whole goal is just to go to a hotel, pick up a prostitute and stab her with an ice pick because he needs to get these urges out. He doesn't even seem particularly evil or sadistic or even like a bad person. You just see these flashes back to his um, something in the past that the movie illustrates the further it goes along. But you feel like that tenseness, that edginess behind, behind it. What separates this is from Giallo is that this is not a mystery. The main, the character that uh, Christopher Abbott plays would normally be like the black gloved killer that you would see. This one lets you know from the very beginning that this guy is a freak with very twisted sexual hangups. I was very disturbed from the opening where it opens. This is not a spoiler because you'll see this pretty fast. He's standing over his baby holding a screwdriver over the baby's mouth and it looks like he's trying to fight some weird urge. So I guess it makes sense that he would go out and try to get a prostitute to try to purge whatever his dark urges or his desires are. And I love the sequence when he's in the hotel and he's preparing for the kill. He's like walking himself through how he's going to talk to the girl, how he's going to get her to trust him then catch her off guard, joke her, the stabbing, how all here, how he's going to clean her up, how he's going to drain the blood. He walks through the whole process as if he's doing it. And then you have the sound effects as if he's actually doing it. So when he's miming out how he's going to stab her with the ice pick, you hear the stabs. When he tosses a non-existent ice pick, you hear it clang to the floor. You hear him washing things. You hear like the body thump. I find I have this strange fascination with sequences where movies where people are miming things out, actions out. To, while the sound effects are plugged in to what they might be doing. I found that whole sequence actually kind of mesmerizing and it really gets you into the disturbed psychosis of the main character, the level of detail and how much he's like all, all of his urges and all the things that he want, wants to do. Pretty disturbing, but um, very, intro, very uh, fascinating stuff. Well, th this, <clears throat> this is really a bold film and it works mainly because of the, the actors. Uh, Christopher Abbott is awesome in this. He's another young actor who's just burst onto the scene recently with a Possessor, a Black Bear. He was really good in with Aubrey Plaza. He was also in It Comes at Night. And then uh, opposite him is uh, Mia Wasikowska. I who love was in, her. Uh, this awesome movie, uh, Stoker. She was in that. Only Lovers Left Alive, a, a great vampire film from Jim Jarmusch. Uh, Crimson Peak. And then uh, another standout is this is Leia Costa, who plays uh, Mona, the wife. Uh, and the synopsis is hold on, a man hold on, sings. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. One thing I want to say, her best performance for me, though, is on the show In Treatment in 2008. 
with uh, Gabriel Byrne from Hereditary, where she plays a young high school gymnast who is going through some kind of abuse in her life. That's where I first discovered her. Uh, so I'm not surprised she did such a wonderful performance. This girl is a fucking kick-ass actress. I mean, she can act. Like, I, like I, you have not seen that show? Check out In Treatment. She is awesome on that show. That's what I always mostly remember remember her from. Well, she has a tiny part in this compared to the other the two leads, but still, the the little bit that she's in this is very effective and and exactly as effective as she should be as that type of character. Mm. Uh, and as as you mentioned before, it's it's about a man who seems like a typical yuppie with a wife and a baby, but he fantasizes about committing murder. Uh, he tells his wife he's leaving on a business trip, but instead checks into a hotel so he can call an escort service and kill an unsuspecting prostitute. And uh, Christopher Abbott, I mean, he's beginning to creep me out in everything he does. I'm beginning to think like this guy is just a creep and a weirdo because he plays it too well. <laughs> he has, I see what he seems to specialize in. He's a pretty good looking guy. He has like this quality about him where he's like a handsome, vapid yuppie with nothing behind the good looks. There's nothing really behind there. And there's something about him. He has a certain quality to him that seems perfect for psychotic roles because he has kind of such like, he has that yuppie look. He just looks like a regular guy or a good looking dude. Like he just looks like somebody who, if you saw on the surface, looks like they would have their life completely together. He looks like somebody who's like, I'd want to be that guy. He, he has like his life together. But I, and he has this sociopathic acting style that seems very detached, but genuine. Yeah. Not detached in a way that feels fake or it feels like he's like half-assing the performance. He seems genuinely detached. So I'm saying that's what makes him such a good actor. He's perfect for that for these types of sociopaths because he has the appearance of somebody that you could trust. Nobody would ever suspect him because he just seems like a, like, you know, it's just an upper class yuppie guy who's got it all together. He always projects that kind of quality. And I think that's what would make him a believable sociopath in the real world. Somebody who would be able to get away with being a sociopath for such a long time, because it's not somebody that anybody would really suspect or think of as that kind of person. And between this and possessor, both great horror movies. It seems like he's specializing in a certain type of role in very out there horror movies in very non-typical experimental boundary pushing horror films. And he has this look on his face. Like he has something depraved in his mind. Like he wants to do something horrible to you. Like he's, but he's got the pretty boy look, but I don't know his, his face hangs in a way. Like he's thinking about what he wants to take you apart. A lot. Doesn't he have a touch of innocence about him? Not in the way yeah. that I think his thoughts are like good or they're pure, but you could tell he's thinking something twisted, but there's almost something childlike in his fascination with the violence. He doesn't strike me as like he's doing it for sadistic purposes or like he gets pleasure out of the sadism of it all. There's like almost like a childlike approach to how he wants to do this and the violence. Like, I. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, it's this very weird dichotomy that he has going on as an actor where he seems like he wants to do awful things, but he doesn't seem like his intentions are awful, even though you know what he wants to do is bad. It, it might sound weird, but this guy, and especially his character in this one, he kind of reminds me of Tom Sizemore's character in Natural Born Killers. Mm-hmm. Like Tom Sizemore in Natural Born Killers, he's a, he's a cop, He's very much outwardly a cop who seems like he wants to get his man, but there's something depraved and sinister and perverted about him. And especially that scene where he's in the, uh, in the jail cell with Juliette Lewis Mm -hmm. and she gets him kind of, kind of worked up and he's, he gets kind of rubbery and weak. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what this guy reminds me of in this one. Just a, just a skeeved out nasty person inside of his head with that pretty exterior. (laughs) <laughs> that's a good way to, to, to describe it. It seems like he has a car uh, uh, specialty. Um, his performance is great, and so is uh, Mia Wasikowska as the prostitute that he picks. And again, I love this actress. I think she is a fucking phenomenal actress. She always, always impresses me and blows me away. Uh, she has... Um, he picks up... Uh, uh, I mean, we had to talk a little bit about it. The prostitute that he picks up is not 
just a regular prostitute. He thinks that he's going to pick up somebody and this is going to be an easy thing. He's going to stab her. But it's very apparent from the first time you see her, she has something else going on in her head. She seems like there's something else going on. They both project the certain type of quality where they look like beautiful people and they look like regular people, but there's something going on. There's wheels turning behind that seem like they are thinking things that are questionable, though not necessarily awful. I got from the very moment that I saw her, I knew that this was not going to be a typical prostitute. There's going to be a little bit more complications with it. And I love their first interaction together, the awkwardness, the way that she kind of toys with him, like, like by touching herself and teasing him a little bit. She sees right through his facade and knows that there's some, instantly that there's something dark underneath that guy. And I think she senses that we might be able to get along because I sense that you have a darkness in you that I also possess. But it, did you feel like me where every time you think you know what she's thinking, she does stuff that's opposite of what you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she does. She's unpredictable. You don't know what she's thinking, but you know the wheels are turning and there's some kind of darkness going on. But she was upending my expectations because I expected her, when I started to see what she was doing, I was like, dude, she sees right through this guy. And I think she's starting to see through the core of who he is, like takes one to no one. And you think that she's going to do something like turn the tables. I'm like thinking, I'm sitting there thinking she's going to stab this guy or something. And it's going to be a struggle of the wills. And what she ends up doing instead takes you off guard, takes the Christopher Abbott character off guard and completely rearrange like, holy shit, what is going on here now? Yeah. She, she perplexes him just as much as she perplexes you. Mm -hmm. So I, I knew what was going on in his head the whole time. I had no idea what was going on in her head. And, and I had no idea how he was perceiving her because he seemed to be confused by her. Some of his actions almost seemed to be confusing because he was trying to figure out where she was going. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he was, he was getting really confused by some of her actions. And he, I thought you wanted that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it seems, and you know what? He got confused by her actions. And you know what? In all fairness... I can actually see how he would get confused because she wants him to do things to him that are also dark and he wants to do things to her that are messed up. But I think what she wants him to do are just things that are sick and painful and violent, not necessarily murder, not ending your life. But the way that she teases him along and teases the fact that she has all these scars and makes him touch it and gets off on it and they start talking about these sadist things, I start thinking maybe she wants him to stab her. I can see how he can have the misperception that, oh, this girl's into what I'm doing. And then she turns the tables on him. He turns it back on her. And it's this weird back and forth between these two very sadistic people. And it's hard to know where each one is going. But what's crazy is he doesn't, he doesn't fully turn the tables on her. She allows it. That's what got me every time. Like, I yeah, she's getting she off on it. it. But can you see how he might misinterpret her? Like how he might think it's okay to go a little bit further than a little bit too far because she almost seems like she invites it. And yeah, she and doesn't. he doesn't. He makes her, she makes him rethink his fetish, it seems like. Because mm -hmm. he seems to be confused like, okay, I wanted to do this against her will. I wanted that fear to be a part of it. But now that she seems into it, I want her to be into it. Mm -hmm. So then you, as, it seems like he's trying to figure out if he wants to do it against her will or if he, if he wants her into it. So, so he, can, he kind of allows her to do some things too. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's what it, it was crazy. Dude. It kept pulling me back and forth as a viewer and as someone invested in the story. And it's like a psychological, like, I don't know how to describe it. It's like the psychological meeting of the minds. And I would, it's battle of the wills is not really the best way to describe what's going on, but there is some kind of battle going on between two people that are very sadistic, very dark, have some kind of trauma in their past and both have very violent, unusual proclivities. And it seems like I don't want to ruin the last scene, but you know how the movie ends, the thing that he says to her, and then the movie ends. At first, I was a little bit disappointed because it seemed to have an abrupt ending. Then I thought about it for a minute. I was like, no, that's actually a great ending. Like, I, I had to think about it. I was like, no, that, that ending actually fits. 
they almost seem like they're two of a kind and she has a lot to teach him. Yeah, well, the, I feel the, like the, the ending is open-ended, but it's also it also comes full circle. Yeah, it comes full From circle. It seems like she's dominating and it seems like he's scared or he's about something's about to happen. Mm-hmm. And then it ends in a way I'm like, maybe he's into it or maybe they're going to teach each other or maybe they are going to be locked in this weird fucked up relationship where they're constantly abusing and torturing each other and turning the tables on on each other. They seem almost made for each other. Also, though, even though they seem almost made for each other, I think the girl has a little bit of a darker bent behind her. He has that darkness in her, too, but I think she has it more and she's more slippery. He's a little bit yeah. easier to read. She's dark too, but she's a little bit slippery. And I get the feeling that she really has a lot to teach him. That that relationship, as weird as it sounds, like he she can teach him a lot about himself, about his desires, about his fetishes, about what he's into, about what it really means to do what you're actually doing. There's just so much psychologically stuff that's just psychologically fascinating with these two characters meeting up with each other. Because she's a lot more complex than he is mm-hmm. as a person and much, much more thought out and, and, and possibly just as dark, if not more. Mm-hmm. And it seems like she wants to draw the darkness out of him. Like yeah. she and, wants to draw that sadism out of him a little bit. And, and it seems like she might have indulged in her fetishes a little more than he has. Mm-hmm. Like he's I, he's still fairly new. He's a lot of his fetishes have happened in his head up to this point, and he's finally going to take him. action on them. So he's pretty much a rookie at at satisfying his own fetishes. Mm-hmm. And, and she's think, like a master experienced in schooling him. <laughs> and I think that's why I I think the ending really works as abrupt as it ends, and it doesn't give you the kind of payoff that you're expecting. But I think it's thinking about it after it's probably the perfect ending for these two characters. You get the sense that at least I get the sense that there's going to be a relationship going on between them. I don't know how long it's going to last because any relation that's that much based in sadism is sadism and violence. Somebody's going to eventually die, but I feel like she's going to teach him a little bit more about his own dark fetishes and about what he's into. Yeah. It's a, it's a similar dynamic to creep Two. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. That's a good way to put it, except a lot more psychotic because the person yeah. is more is more psychotic. And um, I wanted to get back to something. You mentioned the Giallo elements in it. I was into this movie from the beginning. I don't know why. I was like, the moment that the music from Deep Red came on and there was that split screen, when you see um, Christopher Abbott and Mia Wasikowski as she's walking towards the door, the split screen of him walking towards the hotel room door and him like anticipating her and then no, 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 no. With that goblin score. I like, I don't know. I almost like geeked out. I like felt myself. I was, I shot up and sit up and I was like, Oh hell yeah. This is about to get good. Like it brought out that excitement and brought out a certain excitement in me. And I'm not really always into like people appropriating other scores. Quentin Tarantino knows how to do it right. He knows how to appropriate scores from other films and actually make it sometimes work better in his own movies. But, um, Goblin and those scores for Dario Argento are so bold and so specific to that vision. It almost got me excited. That was like, here is a loving tribute to Giallo movies. Here is a tribute to Giallo movies that gets what makes them exciting, that gets that rush that you get out of them. I seem like that split screen moment with the music from the Goblin from Deep Red as they're walking towards, it seems like a moment of fate, like fate crashing into each other. Like these two characters, almost like they were meant to be together or they were meant to meet each other or that's important in both of their personal journeys that they link up with each other that that scene floored me in such a strange way it it pulled me in 10 different directions Mm -hmm. from the moment it came on there's something dare i say iconic about it it is even even though it uses an iconic like in that split second i hear this 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 musical score that that's I that's very you familiar. Strong, you associate you already have strong associations with that musical score too. Yeah, because because Deep Red isn't just uh, a movie that I love and I'm familiar with. I'm very familiar with the score because I keep the I keep the song in my rotation on a regular basis. 
So I instantly got excited about it. And then I was like, no, why do that in a movie that I'm so fully engrossed in, you took me out of it. And then in another split second, I was completely engrossed feeling what it, what it meant me to feel. So it pulled me in, a, in 10 different directions at the same time. So you see this, I feel it's a strange choice. She arrives at the hotel, you hear the, you hear the, the deep red score. Somewhere within that score, it becomes exhilarating. Yeah. Like you feel the weight of this scene. You feel how important, how to the story, to the whole film, to the whole experience this scene is. This and is what not just, these are about. Yeah. And not just because it's a familiar song, but because it's so utterly perfect for that scene. Like you can't deny how perfect it is. I don't care if it was used on another movie. And then okay. that followed directly by the De Palma split screen. It just, it was just wild. It, then, it was just iconic. De Palma already flirted with uh, giallo elements. And I think we argue Dress to Kill is basically an American giallo film. But like it, it a lot of movies that try to like imitate or ape certain things from other films or different directors do it and it's just kind of there and it takes you out of it like they don't always understand what made those moments work so well in the first place and i get the feeling that nicholas pesky actually understands what makes those moments work in the first place and like it's so cinematic watching those split screens as as she walks towards the door and he anticipates her and that music that just kind of exhilarates you and everything and like this is what films are all about. This is what movies can do that no other art form can. That thing that you would describe as cinematic, where you're using every element, the cameras, the music, the actors, to get a grand sense of almost operatic emotions, where cinema can make moments that feel small, just somebody walking up to the door and somebody behind it waiting, feel large and operatic and huge and almost like, cosmic in a certain way that level of cinematic quality like this is what movies are about that moment to me sums up what movies can do that you cannot get out of any other art form and i, I love the eroticism in this oh yeah because it's very sexy very erotic but it's erotic in the same way that for me that david cronenberg's crash is like it's it's erotic but it's eroticism derived from a borderline fetishistic mm -hmm. type of psyche, you know, where it's, it's, it feels erotic, but it also feels dangerous and strange and unpredictable and stylish. Like the eroticism flows from the kind of lust for danger. Yeah. And then the, the, the whole experience of it, even like the, the little grindhouse opening, you have a little grindhouse opening and then that kind of transitions into a vaguely retro intro and then it has that same vaguely retro outro mm -hmm. but it all works it's like the grindhouse aesthetic and then the the it's it's uh it's retro but it's it doesn't feel like it's trying to be retro it's just mm -hmm. that that cool kind of retro music and then the 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 use of music and score phenomenal another one that that starts out with a great score and just builds on it. You got these electronic pulses and modern beats and soundscapes, and then they're mixed with this vintage feel, mixed with contemporary songs that don't seem like they should fit, but they do. And I love when a filmmaker can get, can get that right. He does it, I think he does it like four or five times in this one. Usually, uh, if a movie's gonna do it, do it effectively, it does it once, where you take a happy sounding contemporary song and make it sound dark and seedy he does it like four or five times in this one and it works every single time because have you noticed that in each one of these sections it kind of lingers on this this atmosphere of like uh uh vintage almost like standard type of contemporary pop songs yeah it does it does it's kind of a weird feeling mm -hmm. yeah so i this is like um it's also a very small movie and a very intimate one and it's very short. And if you really think about it, there's not really that much that happens in terms of the plot. Like the movie doesn't really like, once it gets to a certain place, it's kind of locked into a certain kind of mode. You know what I mean? Yeah. Once it gets to the place where she arrives at the hotel, the it's weird. The plot is never advanced, 
but the characters are advanced and their story arcs are advanced without making the plot feel like it ever moved or even went anywhere. But the characters are in a different place after all the time spent together and the games that they play and the way that the tables keep getting switched back and forth, back and forth. And uh, speaking of that, and even though it, it stays pretty simple with the story, it sets up the whole story and the whole aesthetic of the movie pretty much right away. So, so you're watching it and you're like, where is this going to go? Only a great filmmaker is really going to take this in a compelling direction. And he does. Yeah. And it doesn't have like too many locations or anything, but all locations are used to their best, to their best advantage. But it's, uh, this was the one that really nailed it to me. Obviously it doesn't have, the mystery element that you get out of Giallo just by the fact that we know from up front who the killer is and why he wants to do it. But it gets that operatic feeling right. It gets the atmosphere right, right. The sense of twisted sexuality, the violence tied to it all, the music, the score, the cinematography, it just gets it right without ever feeling like it's too self-consciously trying to recall what it is, what it's supposed to be. And, and you still get the ambiguity though. It still has ambiguity to it. I think that's what the, makes the ending work is you don't you you kind of understand where this relationship is heading by the end of the movie and by the time it ends though you don't know what's going to happen there is like you said a, it is very ambiguous and you have to stop and think about what you just watched and you have to think about what's going to happen with these two characters and really it's really hard for me to say wh how that relationship is going to go on outside of the film yeah, and, and there's also a couple of things that left me questioning what I've seen. Okay, when the, I won't give any details, but when the baby talks to him, you know the baby's not talking to him, mm -hmm. but it still adds almost a, a layer of strangeness and menace to it. But then, was he actually talking to his wife on the phone when she was saying all those strange things? I don't think so because if i question it i thought about that for a while the only reason I, I think it's in his head is because they show him right at the bench where he was sitting next to the telephone booth right after almost like he was looking at it and have that almost like he was fantasizing his wife was okay with all of this and she's talking to her and she's like it's okay you're just gonna stab her and everything and maybe she's into it and i know you got yeah. dark urges out so you could go home and become be a family man and, and take care of the me and the baby like yeah. understanding wife like i know this is something you just have to do but i don't but when he goes off at the beginning there's no indication that she knows what he's doing yeah. like it's kind of misleading so it's obvious that this character really lives inside of his head and had a very messed up relationship with his mother which is often the case there's always like these oedipal complexes in a lot of giallo movies with the killers always have some weird sexual hang-up that's tied to their mother and some sort of kinky abuse. Yeah. And then she, she almost teaches him how to get more out of his fetish. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just a uh, excellent movie, a small movie, but one, one that feels small and very intimate it's in scope, but like the feeling and the psychological battle kind of feels almost operatic or large, even though it mostly can take place in the confines of like apartments or small yeah. things or places like that. And what was he huffing to keep him on an even keel? Like that's, that's when I really got the idea of how depraved he was in his head that he was, he was getting all anxious and having some kind of panic attack. And then he stuck this cloth to his face, huffing something like it was, <laughs> Like a weirdo. <laughs> kind of oh, reminiscent of like a Dennis Hopper as Frank Booth in Blue Velvet. Yeah. Like before he does his weird shit, he starts huffing, uh, I think it's nitrous oxide or something. Like uh, amyl nitrate. Amyl nitrate. That's yeah. what he, it was. Just like it's a gas that makes you irrational and pumps up your sex drive to absurd levels. But yeah, it kind of had like that Blue Velvet type of feel. And in fact, even the apartment that she's in reminded me a little bit of Blue Velvet now that I'm thinking about Dorothy Valen's apartment, the way that it's like kind of like the colors in it, the color scheme reminded me a little bit of that as well. Yeah. And I love how, how it toys around with your expectations and, and, you know, 
she's so enigmatic. Is she troubled or, or is she just more twisted than he is? Is she the predator? Is she the prey? Does she even care whether she's predator or prey? Maybe not. I mean, is is she getting off on being one or the other? <laughs> or I think she's getting off on being both, on being yeah. predator and prey, almost being able to switch at her own will. I'm going to be this guy's prey. Now I'm going to switch. I'm going to be a predator. Now I'm going to give some control back to him and make him feel like he's going to hurt me or something before flipping it back on him. Like, it seems like she gets off on all of the elements of sadism. Like she's very versed and experienced it and can appreciate the sadism on different levels, both when it's directed towards her and when she's directing it towards somebody else. Whereas yeah. his character seems like he needs to be sadistic to sort to someone else. And it seems like she wants to push him to explore his sadism and to understand what it is at a much deeper level than he does. Yeah. And it, tell me if you were affected the same by this movie as I was. It got to a point where all of it was very uh, measured, very dramatic, very layered, uh, very patient with everything that was going on. Everything seemed to be pitch perfect. And then all of a sudden it started going batshit crazy. Like, like not, not off the rails at all. It seemed still very fine, fine tuned, but it started to get stranger, more frenetic. And then when all this shit was going on and I was already feeling like conflicting emotions, I was feeling really weird. And then that big giant bug makes an appearance. And it's all, it almost seems like we're not being shown a giant bug to make us feel strange. He already makes us feel strange and weird. And then it, it seems like the bug appears as a product of what you're feeling already. Did you feel that? Yeah, I guess I could see like, it. Yeah, yeah. I, I felt the same kind of strangeness that the bug made me feel before it made an appearance. So it almost didn't seem as strange that I saw it. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah, I get what you're it, saying. Like it fits in that scene. Why? I don't know why it fits. <laughs> It fits, it makes sense psychologically, even if it doesn't make sense narratively, but it makes sense psychologically. And this is also another thing that makes it a good giallo. Think about the movie that it's referencing, Deep Red. There's a couple of sequences in Deep Red um, that involve this little girl who's torturous to animals. Do you remember in Deep Red, she stabs a lizard and then the father smacks her. And after he smacks her, she seems to like that her father smacked her. And then you see, yeah. realize that there's just a dead lizard on the floor, not dead, but a writhing lizard that she just stabbed and like put, uh, and it's just writhing and it's gross and it's uncomfortable. That doesn't really advance the plot of Deep Red. It doesn't really have anything to do with what's going on. And yet it does not seem out of place with that film at all. Even though if you yeah. took it out, it wouldn't alter any of the story or what any of it means at all. This is a similar sort of thing. That's another thing that Giallo's did that Dario Argento would do random things that seem uncomfortable that have nothing to do with it. But since these movies are primarily about the atmosphere and the feeling that you get off of it, these things that would normally seem random arise out of the atmosphere of the movie, out of what the, the feeling of the movie. So it seems more in, in place. So that element is very, very much like what, uh, very much something that old Giallo movies would do, particularly Argento. And also like the, the guy in the bear suit in The Shining. Yeah, Almost that's kind like that. Yeah. And this this filmmaker does this a few times that that's just the most intense part when the when the bug makes its appearance. But even several times peppered out peppered throughout the the runtime, he just seems to like he kind of lulls you, the director does kind of lulls you into false sense of security like you think you know what's going on and then he just comes in and just shakes you up your perceptions and, and your excitement just shakes you up and makes you feel weird and then puts you back into the movie. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot like that. So that element only just helps it nail what Giallo's did in the first place. Yeah. And then, and then we already discussed that awesome ending where it just mm. kind of open-ended, but it still brings things full circle. And it, it, like you said, you can't imagine it ending any other way when you think back on it. Yeah, like I said, and it was the, initially slightly disappointing, but then after I'm like, how how else would they have ended it? And how, if it ended in some kind of sadistic act of violence, it would almost seem make the movie less unique or less special because the movie 
is always playing its cards close to the chest since you never know exactly what's going on in the characters' heads, even though you have kind of strong ideas, you get confused by it. I think if you would have revealed it, it would have betrayed how the rest of the movie felt. So it ends up feeling perfect for what it is. It's that ambiguous quality that the movie had the entire way through, and it never lets up on its vision. Initially, you might think you want a more typical, satisfying climax in person, like climax, but the more you think about it, you realize that actually would have been completely wrong for this movie. Yeah, and another feeling it gave me that I can't quite explain is right when it ends and you see this, the story come full circle and it's kind of a strange open-ended ending and it kind of hangs on the ending just for a second and then it blends into that outro that's just like that was just like the intro that's vaguely retro and it just felt oddly exhilarating to me just one last exhilarating thing where i was excited about how it all wrapped up yeah yeah and, and i almost felt like i seen movie. like I, I felt like i seen a big explosive climax i don't know it gave me that same feeling and i don't know why a big explosive explosive climax, even though it's almost anticlimactic. Yeah, because the explosion happens in here. In your head. Like in, in here, you're, oh, man. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't ever spell it out for you. And yeah. I think that's what makes it uh, such a good movie and such a unique one. And um, I really like Eyes of My Mother a lot. Um, I think I might like this a little more. It's, it's hard yeah, for me I, to say. I think they're pretty close in quality. I, I'd, I'd, look, I'd have to re-go back and rewatch The Eyes of My Mother again, but I think I might prefer this just a little bit more. I, th I think that the other one was just engrossing, as engrossing from beginning to end and kind of shakes you up the way this one does, but this one, this has more exhilarating moments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the best way I can describe it. I mean, I, I think they're both pretty even in quality. Yeah, definitely. But, but, this one, the way it shakes you up and exhilarates you so many different types of ways. I just loved it. And, and dare I say, I've seen some excellent movies with both of these actors, and I think it's the best performance I've seen from both of them. I would still go with In Treatment for Mia Wasikowski, but this is pretty close to that. Pretty close. Only because of that. I know that's not it's on topic, but in that show, she plays somebody who's in therapy. And when you're in therapy, you reveal your innermost emotions. You know um, what I mean? This is a guarded character. Like it's a great performance, but it's a guarded character. So you can't really ever get inside her, your head. Whereas her character in, in treatment uh, is resistant to therapy, but then you like, you know, the type of intimate things that you could only get out of therapy. So I think the performance calls, but it's a fucking fantastic. This is my second favorite performance of her. That's, as right now. that's the one that's all uh, psychiatric sessions, right? Yeah. Every episode of In Treatment is just Gabriel Byrne um, interviewing, uh, not interviewing, but in, in kind of in, in treatment, um, treating one of his patients. So the show would work where Monday he would have the same patients. The show would come on Monday night with the same patients and you'd follow that storyline. Tuesday night it was a different patient. Wednesday was a different patient. Thursday it was a different Friday was his own therapy session. So you could like follow that show only the care. If you wanted to, you could just follow the characters who you were interested in. So I think she was like Tuesday or a Wednesday character, but like, um, she gets really like you. And I think anything that takes place in therapy, you're going to get more performance out of an actor because you're asking them to reveal the inner depths of somebody uh, things that you normally keep inside things, very intimate emotions, you're revealing them in a very enclosed area. And ever since I saw her in that, I've always wanted to see her in a lot more things because she is a, like such a good actress. She has such uh, she has this quality to her that I can't put my finger on this kind of mysterious quality where she seems like she knows, she knows something that you don't know. And you kind of yeah. want to find out what it is that she knows that you don't know. You want to get inside her head the way that she draws you in. She has a very, um, very special quality to her as an actress. The, the way she carries herself kind of reminds me a little bit of Tilda Swinton. It does. Tilda Swinton with a touch, with more edge of a mystery. Yeah. A little bit something, there's almost something unknowable about this actress that makes you want to watch her. There's something going on behind those eyes that you can't really put your finger on, but you want to yeah. try to grasp what it is 
as much as you can. And I think that's what gives her her quality as an actress and why she's good for roles like this or like as a character like this, who you don't know very well, but you want to know very well, you want to understand. And there's a certain dignity about her. <clears throat> yeah. Like you, you, you just want to watch her no matter what type of role she's playing. Yeah. So she's great. Christopher Abbott's great. Mm -hmm. I think it's directed really well. I think the script is solid, uh, very psychologically incisive, loaded with great atmosphere, cool visual cues, uh, very highly cinematic, very polished, but very small scale at the same time. It does so many things right in such a small, nifty, compact package. Yeah. And I think that's what makes it work. You almost want more of it, but it's kind of good because it's a very short film. To me, it went by so quick. It's so brief. You almost want more of it. But I think that's a good thing. It's better to leave the movie hungering for a little bit more than to leave feeling like you got too overwhelmed. And, and that's rare for, for a, a movie that sets up his narrative so quickly. Mm -hmm. For it to be fully engrossing all the way to the end, that's a, that's a major achievement especially with such a, a metered kind of well-told story yes it is so uh where is this available again i was it on prime i think i watched it on prime i'm trying to remember piercing was on netflix netflix okay piercing is on netflix all right pretty, pretty unbelievable to me that the, a movie like this is on netflix but there we have it <laughs> the other two are on prime then i think yeah yeah, so if you want to check out The Editor, that's on Prime. If uh, Giallo satires or parodies are your thing, apparently they're not mine, you can check it out there. Same for ICU, you can check it out there. And then go on to Netflix if you want to see Nicholas Pesky's piercing. Yeah, and it's the I think the best out of the three that we watched this week is piercing. Yeah, I, I mean, I see you as excellent, but it uh, just suffered a little bit at the end. Not not enough to make it go completely off the rails, but it suffered a little bit at the end. When I don't think anything suffered about piercing. I, there's not really anything off-putting or weird that I could say about it or bad. I mean, even if um, I see you had a better third act, I still think I would prefer piercing. Mm -hmm. I still think I would prefer it as a film. Yeah, I, I think you and I like movies like this, you know, a little stranger, uh, character studies, plays around with your perceptions. More mystery, more to, th I guess, I guess it leaves you with more to think about and it swims in your head more than ICU where I, by the end of ICU, not that you don't think about it, but the story wraps itself up. You understand everything. I wouldn't say it wraps things up in a neat bow. That's not really the correct way to put it but it wraps it up in such a way that the story's over, whereas piercing ends and the story continues in your head. The speculation of where it's going continues in your head. And I think that's what kind of makes it work really well. In these yeah, and, and you want to see it continuing too. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. And that's a, always a great movie, always leaves you wanting more. And that's sure what that one did. So um, this is our first one. This is um, Modern Giallo's Volume 1. We're going to continue to do this periodically. Um, keep checking us out on facebook.com slash, pick, slash Pickles Horror Show and Instagram at Pickles Horror Show. Uh, we're going to leave our flow page in the description of this podcast. All you have to do is click on it or copy and paste it into your browser, and it'll take you to all the places where our podcast is available, where you could see the video on YouTube if you prefer to watch your podcast or you could listen to it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or SoundCloud. And I know we keep saying it, but we'll, we'll get to Anchor and a few other platforms soon. Um, keep following us on every on any form of so, uh, the form of social media of your choice. Uh, we have a lot going on right now. Um, Michael Pickle, uh, my co-host right here, has some films in development, some things that we're working on right now, a good script that he's working on, and he's finished a recent film pay up that we're trying to find distribution for. Um, so keep up with us. We're going to keep you updated. We're going to have some good guests in the future. We're going to keep continuing co covering good, good topics and uh, keep up with our social media as well. Yeah. We have some new segments coming up and everything. So lots of exciting stuff coming up. So keep checking back. We're going to start a group pretty soon for the podcast. Look so out everybody for can interact with us. A Facebook community group for horror show till next week, folks. Happy horror. Happy horror. <laughs>